as a mathematician, I get asked about this all the time. You know, a, a famous author recently asked me, you know, he said, uh, so you're a mathematician. Would you say that life is an algorithm? Is a human just a sequence of zeros and ones? You know, you have people like Ray Kurzweil who believe that they will be able to build machines so that they could upload their mind, their brain, or whatever, whatever they got, you know, onto those machines. And that always gives me pause because I think it's important also for us mathematicians to talk about this because, you know, people look up to us because obviously in today's world, we use, you use this technology. I use artificial intelligence, what you might call artificial intelligence all the time. You know, I use Google Translate, obviously, things like that. You, you know, one could debate what exactly the words artificial intelligence means, but one could argue that this is sort of like rudimentary, you know, examples of artificial intelligence. So I think it's fantastic when we use it for our, our benefit, for our good, right? The problems begin when we actually start convincing ourselves that we are nothing but machines, that we are nothing but, you know, algorithms, specialized computers which are just processing information. And I know it's very tempting. And especially if you look at some people, how they incessantly text and send emails, you know, and, you know, we talked about menu and the meal. They don't even have time to enjoy the meal. So then, of course, the difference between the menu and the meal is lost on them <laughs> because they eat but they don't enjoy, you know. So that is true. But I think that if we actually do experience our lives, you know, if we do go through those experiences, when we do realize that what we do is not an algorithm, is not a formula, we're not following a formula, we're not following an algorithm, this realization for each person, I think, it ultimately should come from within. I'm not going to prove it to you. If you believe that you are a computer, I will not be able to convince you otherwise. And my point is not to convince you that you're not a computer. I mean, you are looking right now at someone who is not a computer. I can guarantee you that. That's all, that's all I know. So I'm not a computer. I'm human. But what I'm trying to do is not to convince you, but I'm just trying to do the fallacy. I want to show the fallacy of that argument from the mathematical point of view, that there is no basis in reality, no pun intended, in saying that a vector is the same as a pair of numbers. It's not. A pair of numbers is obtained when we apply a certain algorithm to it, which involves many choices. It involves the choice of coordinate system, for one thing. So in, it involves my free will then. Professor, is it not true though that if I gave you that pair of numbers and told you the basis, you could make a perfect reproduction of that vector? That is correct. If you, if you, chose, the, uh, uh, if you chose the basis, and you gave me a pair of numbers, I would reconstruct the vector. So why is it not true then that if we agreed on a basis and we agreed on all the coordinates and vectors and all the things that makes up the recipe of you, right. I couldn't make a perfect reproduction of you? <laughs> well, let's, not, let, let's, let's backtrack. Let, not so fast, Brady. Let's first talk about the, the basis. If we agree on the basis, yes, but you see, you, we have to create this basis ourselves. It takes two of us to do that. It's a process that we have to engage in because also it's important, not just we create it, but you and I speak about the same thing. So you and I have to both look at this sheet of paper and have to draw those lines. And that process is not, so you are, by trying to say that, um, you know, if you were to try to say that um, uh, we are reconstructing it from the numbers, but what it's, it's predicated on is, the, is that basis that you and I are creating. And that's the same kind of process which then needs to be, you know, in included in this picture. And that process then is not uniquely represented by numbers and so on. You see what I mean? So that, in other words, yes, you can try to rephrase it and you can sort of put that, that magic black box which converts a vector an object into a pair of numbers. You can shift it from this stage to another stage, namely the stage of creating the basis, but it'd still be there. I, ex I will accept that, okay, I can't describe Ed Frankel just using numbers. Thank you. But could I describe him if you give me a few more ingredients? If I can use numbers, vectors, and transformations, and a few other mathematical tools, could I describe you? I can't just use numbers, but could I describe you mathematically? What makes you think you're above mathematics? 
Well, look, I'm a mathematician, so on the one hand, I would like to say, yes, you know, glory to mathematics, power to mathematics, everything is mathematics, right? I could say that. And that would make me feel so good about myself, right? <laughs> because then I become your guru, <laughs> because you, you have to come to me, <laughs> and, you know, to solve life's problems. But I know better than that, you know, I know that that's not the case. I know it from my own experience that, you know, that there is something else. But, um, you know, look, it's, a, it's, it's something which um, is, a, is, a, is a deeper question, is a more um, nuanced question than what we discussed here. What we discussed here is that things cannot be represented by numbers. And that, I think, is clear from this very basic example that vectors surely cannot, we cannot do justice to a vector just by a pair of numbers or a triple of numbers or whatever. It's something else entirely. But you're raising an interesting point. If not numbers, is it possible that everything is described by mathematical structures? Right? So that would be a little bit more sophisticated mathematical way of uh, you know, representing things. And so, but my answer would be, again, um, that yes, we can represent many things uh, by you know, uh, mathematical objects, numbers, and other things. Um, and actually, some mathematicians have gone as far as to say, and there is nothing else left, that actually the world is mathematics. But I don't believe, I don't believe that to be the case. And I have a few, a few more cards up my sleeve, you know, to a few more arguments uh, to show that that's not the case. Up, uh, I have to say, the biggest argument for me is my personal experience. I just know it for myself that I'm not like this, you know. And I, I don't want to be all mushy and sentimental, but, you know, when I fall in love, it is something which I have inside of me and which no one will ever be able to reproduce in any mathematical terms. That's and, also what people say who believe in God, don't they? They say, why do you believe in God? They say, I just know it in me. That's right. But that, that's the point. So, and there, no one can convince them. What I'm interested in now is not whether it's good or bad, but the possibility of having a feeling, an emotion, a connection, which cannot be described logically, cannot be analyzed logically, cannot be proved or disproved. So, for example, someone's belief in God is an example of that, is an example of something which cannot be accounted for rationally, right? It cannot be proved or disproved. I might say another example, which I see in today's world, even more often, is the belief in rationality. Our belief in rationality, if I may say so, is so irrational. And this belief, the irrationality of that rational, supposedly rational belief, is a great proof, actually, <laughs> that there exist irrational things. So you, you thrust yourself to these rational things and say there is nothing more. But the process of you doing that, I have to say, is irrational. So once you appreciate that, that's how you find an example of something which is not rational, which is something not logical, not uh, conceptualizable, not provable, you see. So that's one, one way to argue. Another way to argue for me would be to, to call the great logician of the 20th century, Kurt Gödel, as, uh, as an expert witness. And that's perhaps, you know, for, for another uh, number file, uh, for another number file video. I'm back in Berkeley in a month. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can, we can talk about this later. But that to me is another example which basically says, another art indication. Again, it's not a proof of anything. It's not a proof. We're not, I'm not trying to prove to you that you're not a machine. You see, so, uh, you know, a viewer of number file who believes that he or she is a machine is going to believe that, no matter what I say, you see. What I'm trying to say is, I'm trying to give a few indications, a few hints, a few metaphors, if you will, you know, uh, which would kind of, I hope that you will take a series and think about it, and maybe this will help you see things in the right light. And so, uh, what we discussed today, but also Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which basically says that the, the, the notion of truth cannot be formalized, that there will always be in a formal system, there will always be, I'm simplifying, a true statement which cannot be proved by the rules of uh, the usual rules of logic, you see. So that's another indication for me that there is something else, that there is more than just a computer program, than just an algorithm, than just a sequence of zeros and ones. What Riemann suggested, the number of zeros is the minimal possible. They all concentrate along this critical line, according to Riemann hypothesis, which still hasn't been proved. His hypothesis is 
that all the zeros to his function lie on that line. 